Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good breakout session. We have people that are logging in right now, so we're going to wait a minute so everybody can have their um, their audio going so you can hear everything. Thank you. Also, special thanks to everybody who is in the Teach California um, breakout session. We had a, a glitch there, and people were really accommodating, and we made it work. And so it just goes to show of the power of teachers and what we do and how we make it work. So we are thrilled that everybody is back with us. Um, hopefully that breakout session was good for you and you learned some great things. We're excited to, um, we have requested all of the breakout sessions from our presenters and we'll be putting them on the teacherprep.org website because we really wanna make sure that you have access to everything. So once we have it all posted, we'll share out an email to everybody to let you know. But with that, um, we have more people still coming in right now, which is fantastic. But with that, I would like to introduce Tanette Salter. Tanette Salter works with the Joint Special Populations Advisory Committee, which is, a, is a, a statewide organization that really focuses on equity. And how do we have an equitable education experience as, for all students, but especially our students in special populations? Tanette and I have been partners and collaborators for probably well over a decade at this point and she's one of just the most trusted people in education that you can go to she's intelligent she's a true committed partner and she is on the front line of the equity work and it's um and she's walking the talk because tanette has been working on equity and issues of equity and issues of access for many many years now it is an honor to have us here have her here with us today and talking and reflecting about silver linings and, and what education is going to kind of look like. And so, Tanette, thank you so much for being here. Greatly appreciate you joining our conference today, and I'm excited to hear what you have to share with our team. Renee, thank you so much. I am so honored to see all of these beautiful kings and queen faces that I'm seeing. Um, hug yourself for today. Just do it. Hug, hug, you know? I love that you did that. I used to have my kindergartners do that. <laughs> and um, Renee, thank you for a wonderful introduction. And I'm humbled. I'm very, very humbled about it because I don't really think about the work that I'm doing as enough. I feel like I don't do enough. I could do more. I'm always feeling like I can do more, as I'm sure that every single individual's face that I see feel the same way that, that I'm talking about. I have you for 15 wonderful, strong minutes. So um, I wanna make the most of it, but I see people still kind of trickling in. So one of the things that I wanna ask you is can you just pop into the chat your name and where you're from? I would love to see that just kind of, the chat just kind of blow up from that perspective because we don't have the time to really go around and introduce ourselves. Hi, Alma from Pierce College, Marcy Davison Reevely College, Patty Schmoltz, I hope I'm saying that correctly. If I mess up your name, please, please forgive me. Patricia from Pierce College, Kathleen, Denise Kennedy, Claire Boss, Patricia Ramirez, Renee, Kim, what's up? Anna Garcia, Sandri Frisbee, Megan Kalinsi, how you doing, Megan? Bobby, so good to see you. Kisses to you. Christy Waterman, Blanca. Vera Campbell, Imelda, is it just keeps going. This is Annette, and I've got to say, you're saying names, and I am so I'm like looking at it going community college, UC, CSU, agency, like the cross, you know, it's it's yes, a lot. And it's the cross lot. systems, Jamie Jones and Sean, I do believe. Sean Sean, I hope I said that correctly. Son, Son thank you. Son, very much. We even have colleagues coming in from out of the country right now. Wow, this is impressive. Carol, I missed your name, but how are you? Hopefully today is going to be fabulous for you. And anyone else, if I missed, God bless you and welcome. So let's get started. What I'm going to do is give you a quick overview of what JSPAC does. She kind of gave you the acronym of that, and then we're going to go right into so hope. We're going to go right into what hope is and in hope in difficult times. So I'm going to share my screen. If one of you, two of you, or all of you could just tell me that you see the screen with a thumbs up, that would be fabulous. Anybody gonna give me a thumbs up? Thank you, Renee. So when you see these individuals, special populations, you think California Perkins Joint Special Populations Advisory Committee, I'm kind of like fumbling on my words here, so forgive me with that. But we have been around for a long time. 
We began in the 80s, but we really were established in 2000 as an advisory committee. We are not a voting advisory committee, but we are an advisory committee that is um, represented by about 26 representatives statewide. And that's coming from K through 12. That's coming from the community college system, as well as private and public sector or nonprofit organizations. And what all of these individuals have in common is passion and advocacy and equity in terms of special population individuals. Today, you're gonna to hear me say something very different. Instead of referring to special populations as if they are not beings, because that is a classification that we call in our system and has been identified by Perkins. These are people. So they are classified for funding purposes as special populations, as well as minorities, and as well as underrepresented, as well as marginalized individuals. It is a term, but it's not reflecting the being, the person, the human, aspect of that person. And we must remind ourselves and keep that in the forefront that they are human beings. What JSPAC does is our, what we do is provide professional development. Our intent is for those that are on this particular virtual webinar is to really empower you with equity and access to professional development. We don't necessarily touch those students who are classified, but you do. We provide resources that address the challenges. And that's another thing. I tend to not use the term barriers because barriers seems very, very asset thinking. Like Tanette, the student has a barrier. So therefore she can't learn. I have a challenge, right? There's challenges. We all human beings experience challenges. So for career education students that are recognized, again, as special populations, marginalized, underrepresented, second chance, disproportionately impacted in veterans. There is even more labels that I could put on here, but you get the gist of how we label and classify, and it all has to do with funding. Every one of these is particularly funding, funding aspects. So I wanna start with Martin Luther King, as you see him in the back too of my screen. We must accept finite disappointment. Boy, the pandemic. Can I tell you, everybody's shaking their head, the pandemic, and we're still in it. I keep hearing post pandemic. No, we are still in the pandemic and we don't know how long this is gonna continue. But we what must remember and never lose infinite hope. It's at the same time. How do you look at difficult times, being in difficult times, but don't lose your hope? Don't get sucked into that process and, and reacting, right? How do you be proactive at the same time when you're being reactive? Because there are times you have to be reactive and, and have hope. So we're going to do a little exercise. A little bit of time. I want to ask you, I just, and you can put it in the chat, or I actually like to hear from you. How do you find your silver lining? There is not a wrong answer, educators, because we like to have the right answer. There's not a wrong answer. How do you find your silver lining currently? I'm going to say currently. Current professional world. How do you find your silver lining? Tanette, can I start us off? I know we're going to have some sharing here. I like every day I look for something that I'm grateful for. And I'm going to give an ex like a specific example. Since we were virtual today, I was able to sleep until seven o'clock in this morning. I'm also able to sit here in this shirt. This is one of my conference shirts. I love this one. And guess what? I'm wearing jean shorts and no shoes. And those might be silly silver linings, but they're like a comfort silver lining for me because today I'm giving this conference and I'm, you know, facilitating conferences a lot. It's, you know, it's an exhausting thing to do and I'm comfortable and I'm rested. And if we were not in the virtual space right now, it would have been a different kind of start to the day. And there is absolutely no way that I would be in jean shorts without shoes at a conference. <laughs> I thank you, Renee. And I want to read Carol, is that okay? She shared with 
actually, I only look for the positive side to everything I experience. I do not accept negative thoughts. Awesome. Laughter. Stay focused on students. Yes, laughter does wonders to, to our neurological. Silver lining gratefulness, as Renee said. My wonderful colleagues, self-care, asset model thinking. I love it, Renee said. Anyone else want to share? Able to teach a mom who is also at her child's baseball practice. She wouldn't be able to go to class if we weren't online. Wow. Now that's what we're talking about, right? The outcome of that. That's beautiful. Marcy, I focus on my new grandson. Congratulations and how wonderful the world will be as he grows. Beautiful. Anyone else? In the faces of my students who continue to show up, congratulations to them. Yes, yes, Kim. Thank you for that. Any, anyone else? Rosemary. Yeah, I'm calling you out. I do. Oh, that. yeah. No, I added it in there. Um, my list is really long during the pandemic. I'm, I'm sad about a lot of things, but I'm so excited about all the new learning that's gone on. I have, I know more about technology and how to use it. And I still don't know very much, but I am using it in ways I never thought possible before. And uh, the increased access that so many students have had to my classes and the ways that I've been able to learn from my what I call my scholar crushes like Gloria Ladson Billings and um, Bettina Love and so many others. And so I, I have a pretty long list of, of things over the past year that I've been encouraging people to join me in. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I, I have looking for something new. I see um, recipes, trying out new recipes. Yes, that's true. The time to do that now. And um, mentor teachers, yoga online with my same and before teacher. Yes, absolutely. I admire that. I, you know, I tried it, but you know, my, I have to say my psyche just was not there in yoga online. I needed to, I need to be, I have to say that I need to be actually with face-to-face -face on that one, but I hear you. What works for you and your silver linings to, to move forward in your profession and personal life, because it's all pro crosses over. Um, I got to teach yoga to my daughter's second, wow, that's nice, second grade class. So everyone, thank you for sharing how you find your silver lining. Use that. It's very easy. I asked that question and look how much feedback that you provide it, but use that in your day-to-day -day work and use that for planning for the future and moving forward. Use that to have an equity lens. Equity, we think about equity and we think about students. We think about people, we think about the human being, but it also is insight. It's gaining insight. So I want to talk about, you guys mentioned some of this, but this is kind of what a collectively Jay Speck has kind of looked at, the infinite hope of education through the pandemic. And um, because we're going to share, share this, now you have this PowerPoint that you'll be able to reflect back on. And so it's a psychological growth, something that Rosemary kind of was touching on a little bit. The flexibility, you guys mentioned that, the flexibility to be able to baseball and then online and have access in yourself, the independence and choice, right? Providing more independence and choice, not only with you, but with students. And that can be scary. It also has allowed authenticity, to be authentic and to be okay with that. Adaptability for genphasis. New opportunities for socializing. How many of you have heard that you're the students that that probably were face to face and were bullied? They are now just beaming in the virtual space right now. New opportunities for connectivity. For example, this the practicum TPP it blew up over the pandemic. Blew up. What about strengthening relationships and partnerships? Also, it's a way for respite from racial microaggression. I'm only looking at the positive. We could go down. I know that many of you, we could go a different, but just infinite hope in the silver linings. 
rethinking why and what we test. That definitely popped up. Teachers and professors, and Rosemary mentioned this, upgrading their technology school. Me too. Their technology skills. People, kids, parents thriving in the virtual spaces, including students and professors. Questioning your thinking. When before, maybe you wouldn't have been, you just would have just said, okay, I'm going to go with that process. Rethinking how you can do something differently. To connect to provide access, right, to those learning needs. Learned optimism, right? Learned optimism, I put, increases constructive effort. Learned optimism. So most of you guys were talking about when I asked finding your silver lining, that's nothing but optimism. And then it allows spaces for diversity learning. And earlier I said that diversity, I'm gonna say diversity, we get stuck on race and gender but diversity in learning needs, diversity in the perspectives that are in the room. There's over 30, 41 people in this room. The different perspectives is amazing in learning. How do we do that? That's diversity. So eventually I said equity, equity, gain insight, diversity. Use that diversity to get all of those learning perspectives and learning needs. There's more, but here's a list of of infinite hope for education. I'm gonna move on, unless we wanna still continue. I see some more in the chat. Oh, let me go back. Not being available for everyone. Thank you, Lisa, and welcome. Glad to, glad to have you on here. Else, and neglecting myself and my family, leading and shepherding the work of equity nationally is emotionally, but taking time to be present and to travel. Yes, my sister, I've been seeing it, and I'm so proud to see you sharing that, we all need to do that and reflecting and being responsive and loving relationships. Yes, yes, yes. So we did this thing, I'm not saying thing, Renee and a couple of um, CDE, we did a presentation on addressing special populations in remote learning. And what came out of that, because today's session is just really about silver lining, what came out of that was um, the individuals that are part of that presentation identified that there was two, two ways that we were in. We were in crisis remote learning when the pandemic started because we're responding, and then later or now intentional remote learning. As I'm saying to this, I thought about it today and thought, actually, they go back and forth because here we are in a pandemic and now we have this no, another variant, right? And so um, I was just on a call yesterday and a, a particular college decided in three days to put everything back online. I'm not gonna mention the college, everything online because of the cases. So they're back in probably crisis remote, right? And then they'll be intentional remote. So going back to that, silver lining right it's that flexibility we got to be ready for the flexibility you got to be ready you got to be fluid this is the way it is now this is just the way it is and so part of that is that we wanted to hear from different perspectives on what their hope was from the pandemic and i would love to play the video but it is on jspecs for youtube channel but renee if you could just talk a little bit about jessica wilson the parent who talked about her son's experience in distance education. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll do very quickly. Jessica Wilson is a mom of a, of a child who is eight years old. She has three kids, but her eight-year-old child has severe special needs. And um, she shared with us that for her as a parent in the virtual space, there was a lot of challenges because her son goes to so many specialists that it was like beyond her skill set. So she would like try to engage him and whatnot. But it was like a lot more than what her what what she was able to do. And so for her, you know, this the distance learning was really a challenge. So it was fascinating for her to have two children in the general ed population that were fine with distance learning. And then for her own child was severe, you know, working in a severe special ed uh, classroom, he really needed to have some more specialized services. And so the one great thing and a silver lining for that family was her, her child who was eight years old was the first one allowed back on campus before all other populations were. And so even though it was 
definitely a lot of bumps in the road during the pandemic, she was able to see that the school accommodated and got him back as soon as possible. And he's he's back on track now. So hopefully, hopefully the school site that he's at will stay healthy enough that they can stay in the face to face for right now. Thank you, Renee, for that. It was just so wonderful to hear that that hope and especially for um, for students who are classified as special populations and her son in particular is classified as special someone from special populations. I want to touch a little bit on Kim. Thank you for um, saying I appreciate you mentioning microaggressions. They can be seen through video as powerfully as in person. We have the power to make others feel interbelonging by the way we respond physically as well as verbally. And thank you for um, mentioning that. And I want to add to we also think of you hear me say e equity, diversity, and inclusion. But when you think of inclusion, inclusion is also a sense of belonging. And so part of that aspect of inclusion is making sure not just sense of belonging, but also that everybody's voice is heard. And I know that I participated two days ago, I think, in the change and collaborative session. And some words that hit was, um, having the ability to have the voices heard. The connectivity, right? The connectivity was very, very important. That was used a lot, the power of connectivity. Thank you, Kim, for that. And you guys have this PowerPoint slide, so you, I would really recommend clicking on this link and watching the um, testimonial of Jessica Wilson. Wilson. So let's talk about difficult times and how JSPAC looks at silver linings in difficult times. And I kind of think of this as a CERN. That's when I come CERN, we're always acronym. You search for meaning in a situation. And I think that was mentioned earlier. We're in this pandemic. And so what JSPAC did during when the pandemic starts, like, what's the meaning behind this? What is the meaning in this pandemic? What could we do? And we started thinking about the classifications and labeling, the, the efforts, right? The, the just in your face racism. Racism has always been there, but in your face racism that has been shown through social media. Collectively, Jay Speck looked at that. And personally, looking at falling deep in reflection, I think Lisa talked about that reflection and response. And then we reframed the current situation, reframing it. What's been around for so many years? Why is it that we have these process classification? Well, you have to have programs and you have to have a process. But why is it that those processes, this is the questions that JSPAC was asking. Why is it that those processes excluded particular human beings? Right? We now have to diversify the teacher workforce, but that's been going for a long time. Why? because teachers of color were pushed out because of Ford versus Brown, basically segregation, right, passed. And so teachers of color weren't invited to teach. I'm just gonna say that in a way. But the silver lining of that is that supposedly integration, right? Integration, the silver lining of that was integration. But again, that's the humanity of those teachers of color that was excluded and was not considered, right? Was not considered in a policy. If you think about it, humanity was not considered in policy. The same thing with education. We classify, but we're not looking at the being. So JSPAC was like, wait a minute, we need a new approach in how we approach professional development. And it came to, I am a being, I am a human, first and foremost, how you classify me, that is yours. I have feelings, I can think, I learn differently, I have different perspectives, different values, and I'm using I, but that goes for every single one of you that are around in this virtual space, which means it's the same with your students and the students that are coming in. How do you do that? So JSPEC said, hey, we're gonna come up with a humanizing education. We're gonna focus on a humanity approach 
with equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I'll say this, you hear DEI, but you cannot do the diversity work without equity first and inclusion. And I say equity because it's really for you to gain insight. And going back to this, searching for meaning in a situation and reframing the current situation and looking at a new approach. Just because you've been doing it the same way does not mean that you do it the same way. Here we are in a pandemic and the silver lining of the pandemic is it truly is a new opportunity to do things differently. I heard from the change in collaborative about the packet, right? Okay, there's some issues with the practice, but how do you do that differently? Teacher preparation, you have an opportunity to do that differently now. Will it be tough? Yes, difficult times, but go back to your optimism and that constructive effort. That is what JSPAC did. And so we collaborated with an amazing individual, Renee Marshall, and a bunch of other individuals, and we produced a humanizing virtual learning guidebook for cross systems. But I will tell you now that that's going to change because it's going to change to humanizing education, not just in the virtual space. But a big part of what I'm talking about is cultivating deeper and richer relationships with yourself as well. You got to have that deeper and richer relationship with yourself, which is that self-care, along with your peeps your homies, your sisters, your queens, your kings. So long-term and trusting relationships which foster a deep level of connection gives a significant advantage in shifting the perspective of just education to humanizing education. I see a chat, so I don't wanna miss out. Can we have a link to the guidebook? You have a link to the guidebook and guess what? Here we are. We're going to go there just really quickly. It's in this PowerPoint. Tanette, I can also email it out to everybody as well. I'm trying to share as many links as possible. You can, and it's on JSPAC's website now Perfect. under professional development. But here is the guidebook. The guidebook is inspired by the work of Paul Image French, humanizing distance learning education and centering equity and humanity in a time of crisis. If you just bear with me, I'm going to read you a little something from the foreword written by myself, by me. Um, so what I talked about humanity and the current situation and the silver lining. So some practitioners embrace the change with excitement, exhilaration, and others with fear and frustration, which are valid human emotions when treading in a new territory of instructional delivery. The message of humanizing was especially perceptible to me given the heightened acts of racism combined with the health, health crisis. This prompted me to reflect upon my ancestry. So 400 years ago in the South, formal education was obsolete for my ancestors. However, they found alternative learning paths, silver lining, hope. The pursuit of education was a communal effort to include parents, family members, and fellow slaves. So this reflection period that I was talking about, searching, meaning, education, reframe, it became very clear that our focus needs to be elevated on humanity to level the playing field. That doesn't look like race. It doesn't look at race, sexual identity, social identity, funding classification, but rather, Tanette Salter's human learning needs, Renee Marshall's learning, Lisa Wilson's learning needs, her perspectives, her views. So that's what this guide is about. How do we use human capital, which is our most valuable asset? Us, human beings. So go check this guide out. It's got a lot of resources. I just wanted to tickle you a little bit because this is about silver linings. I'm gonna close this. I think I have a couple more minutes. So I wanna close, do I have a couple more minutes or did I go over? 
we're actually over by about 15 right now. So okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, is it so good? We have enough time for our cross system activity. So as long as we transition soon, we will be perfect. Thank we you. We will. I want to leave this and then I want to hear a couple of feedback from everybody. So I will leave you with MLK. May I stress the need for courageous silver linings, be courageous, intelligent, and dedicated leadership. Leaders with integrity. Leaders that are not in love with publicity. And I could add to this process, protocol, creating policies without people being included. Leaders not in love with, I have to, I can't see this, but I know you can see this, with money, but in love with what? You guys got to say this with me. Come on. I love it. Humanity. Humanity. But in love with humanity. That's what we're talking about. Thank you, you guys. Hopefully you go over to your cross systems because you need that humanity. When you're talking oh. about cross systems. You're going to need this. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward, Jay Spack is going to have a virtual conference that is definitely going to be about humanity. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tanette. Let's give Tanette a round of applause. That was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And I've got to tell you, Tanette, we're going to go into our cross system activity, but this slide right at this moment, I have to share something I've been waiting to share. We have had great success with the community college system through our two communities of practice in the last year and a half. We've established a practicum early childhood community practice, and we have established an, an education fieldwork community of practice. And I am very proud to share with everybody right now that starting next month on September 3rd, I'm getting the chills just as I'm lining it up to tell you, we are starting a cross system leadership community of practice and you are all invited. Every month we are going to be bringing in the best leaders in education and equity to talk to us about what they do that works as a leader and how we can strengthen ourselves as leaders in the education system. So Tanette, I love that you said this, leaders in love with humanity because that's the next generation and we're going to work our best to cultivate that and to elevate the next generation of leaders. So thank you so much, Tanette. This was so timely. I'm going to hand it over to Rosemary now because this is going to go perfectly into what we're doing as our cross system activity for the next 55 minutes. So I'm going to hand it over to Rosemary right now. Thank you, Tanette, for your ongoing partnership. Looking forward to the JSPAC conference in December this year. Bye, everyone. Bye, Tanette. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. And, and I'm really excited about what Tanette shared with you because it, it segued perfectly into what Renee and I have put together for this next little section. And um, so there's actually, there's so much we could go all weekend with what she, what she brought up and things I could spin off with, but um, just what we're going to be doing right now is building off of what we did on Wednesday. And so we've all come together to collaborate. We've all come from different systems and structures, but we all have this common goal of encouraging new teachers and removing challenges and barriers that our students face, meaning they can't get into classrooms to help the students who really need them the most. And we seem to agree that a major challenge that we're facing in building a more representative teaching force is that our current system is not working for our Black, our Latinx, Indigenous, Asian, and other students of color, along with our college students who are outside of the quote unquote traditional model. And many of our established practices just don't serve these students well. So in the discussions that we had the other day, we were looking at um, a need to come at them from some different angles. And one angle that is supported very well by educational research, research shows that before we can really address the challenges in our systems, we have to understand who we are and our own complicity and role in perpetuating them. So we have to do our own work before we can meaningfully shift our practice. So identifying what we bring into the classroom, the district, the department or organization shifts the focus to changing the system 
instead of trying to change our students and the humans in our classrooms. And if we get an understanding of our position and the power or lack of power that we have, we can better relate to our students. And I think that's a lot of what Tonette was talking about, about the humanity. Let's, let's put the blinders on and look at who's in our classrooms, who we're working with and how we can meaningfully affect some change. So we need to build our practice by continuing to seek out and understand the assets that students are bringing into the space rather than dwelling on what they're lacking. And before we can truly appreciate our students and their ways of knowing and being, we need to have a sense of who we are ourselves as, educa as educators, as individuals, and importantly, as part of the community and what actions we're going to take to influence the systems in which we work. So we're going to be taking some time right now to practice this and hopefully set us up for success as we move forward. In just a minute, I'm gonna share with you a word cloud that Renee and I created yesterday based on the report outs that y'all did on um, Wednesday. Which were some of like the best data. Okay, I'm so old school. Rosemary was laughing. I printed everything. I was highlighting. I went through every single one of our groups except one was cross system. This is gold, what came yeah. out on Wednesday, and we can't wait to build upon it right now. Sorry to interject, Rosemary, but I want to let them it's know we, we were in it. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Um, and so I, uh, Something that I have really embraced over the last couple of years as I was doing research on my dissertation and teacher researchers is the fact that as educators, we're participating in a constant cycle of inquiry, reflection, action, and then starting all over again, making new decisions based on the results of the last thing that we just did. And Marilyn Cochran Smith and Susan Lytle call this inquiry as stance. And they point out how we are constantly evaluating our own plans, decisions, and lessons for how we can better serve our students by conducting and acting on real-time research. Yes, we are researchers, whether we're in a early childhood classroom, a preschool classroom, a kindergarten classroom, a 12th grade classroom, a community college classroom, or as an organization that is facilitating an educational or learning opportunity. We're doing real research and our subjects are our students and the result of that research is new information and new ways of knowing and learning. So in my intro to education course, I teach the 45 hour field work course. We don't start with standards and curriculum. We start with community building. We start with exploring our own identities and understand our position in the, in the space that we're in so that we can then better understand our students. So I model and invite my students to practice this cycle of inquiry to help them see how they can develop a truly student-centered curriculum. And as Tanette was talking about, when we really understand what the strengths are that our students are bringing into the classroom, then we can do better for them and we can find those silver linings a whole lot more quickly uh, if we look at them from uh, what they're bringing in instead of what they're not what they didn't make it here with so to start off our activity you are going to engage in a collaborative exercise and this is something i do myself and i do with my own students and you're going to have some time to reflect on these questions that I'm gonna share with you to help clarify your own and maybe your organization's steps towards clearing the path between systems. So now we get into the text. So please bear with me as I'm gonna share my screen with you, I hope, of your word cloud. And so hopefully you're seeing the cross systems collaboration. Hopefully that's showing up. Some of them are pretty small. But I, I mean, Tonette didn't see this before, but she brought up the uh, point that voice was one of the things that came up a lot in the, in the conversations the other day. And sure enough, the words that are larger are the ones that came up across the different groups. So as a, a collaboration, we see that some of the priorities and ideas for moving things forward as cross systems collaborations involve student voice, equity, 
articulation, a statewide facilitator, regional student clubs, TPP dedicated counselors, and more. And just because something is small doesn't mean it's insignificant. It just means that that, that might have been a, a unique way of, of, of wording something. But this is what you came up with as your ideas for moving forward. And I'm really going, I'm going to infuse this activity with the idea of let's go beyond the ideas. What are you willing to commit to for action for next steps? So in, in your groups, you're going to discuss how you see yourselves fitting into the ways in which we can remove these cha the challenges we've explored for our future teachers. You're gonna use the ideas you, you generated and you'll have access to the word cloud. In fact, I will put the word cloud link. I think this will give you, oh, you know what? Darn it, I don't have the right link. I'll have, while Renee's talking, I'll find the right link for that one. I got the one that's the presenter one. Um, so you're going to collaborate together though to make a statement where you are going to um, you are going to answer the following. Ah, make that bigger for you. You're going to answer these these questions. Are you seeing a little template where it says we are at the top? Okay, just checking. All right. So as a group. What is your role in teacher preparation? And it's a group, so you might have several, and that's okay. There's no wrong way to do this either. What do you celebrate? What are the things that you, you as a group are bringing to the table to, to move teacher preparation um, across systems more collaboratively? What are the things that you're battling? Um, what are you fighting? What are the things in the way that you see for moving this forward? Are there communication issues? Are there articulation issues? What are the things that your group might be seeing as obstacles? What do you need to get those things out of the way? And what will you be? So what do you commit to be as part of the solution to all of this? And I'm hoping this will work. And this is an example of how one comes together. So we are former classroom teachers and teacher educators. We celebrate opportunities to cultivate culturally sustaining future teachers. We battle over standardization and resistance to change. We need connection, critical conversations and community support. We will be courageous. Um, full disclosure, I wrote that one, but that was based on your word cloud and a little bit of editorializing on my part perhaps. But that's what I was seeing from the conversations that we've been having. And so we kind of got the sense that there wasn't a love of typing out all that stuff in the Google Doc the other day. So all you have to do, your group will do, um, will do your own version of this. And then you will go and post it on this little Padlet. Okay. And I'll be dropping, I have the link to that for sure that I'll drop in here right now um, into the chat maybe if I can find the chat. And what you'll, and this way your group will have your idea out there for everyone else to see, that's the Padlet. Um, and then we'll come back and share out the process. And if once your group has your, uh, your poem and it is kind of a poem, it actually comes from Encore an Encore adaptation from an Encore activity. Um, once you have that, there's the prompts. You can go on to have a conversation about, you know, next steps. What are some real logical, straightforward things that your group has come together to figure out as a way to affect change and to improve the communication between systems and articulation, um, which seem to be really uh, key to moving forward here. So I'm gonna stop sharing so I can get a better link for the um, word cloud. And I'm gonna let Renee talk for a minute while I do that. And <laughs> well, and I have to just, I wanna just quickly say to everybody, um, when we were um, creating this, you know, it was funny because Rosemary, she, we were talking about what type of um, platform we should do the activity on. So I was like, oh, should we do Pear Deck? Like, what should we do? And she goes, 
you know, I have this activity I do with my students and all of a sudden she pulls it up and she was showing me the platform. And I was like, hold up. This is what we need to do across systems because we at this information that was on here is so valuable. I can't even tell you, but now it's our time for action, you know, and we'll have an analysis of where the gaps are, especially from what everybody shared. So let's now create working together what things will look like. And so hopefully everybody has had a chance to um, open the Padlet on their computer and then copy the prompt because we're going to be going to breakouts in just a moment. So for our breakouts, um, let's see, we're a little bit behind on time and I want to make sure we are solidly wrapped a few minutes before 12 so we can transition to Marquita. So why don't we jump out into our breakouts for maybe about 15, 20 minutes and then we'll come back in and do a share. Does that sound good, Rosemary? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, yeah, and and you know what? If the if the poem is in the way of you having a convers a real conversation about what you're what you see you can be doing, then ditch the poem and just talk about what you think works. Well. But also record it too, whatever you're thinking, so that way we can move that forward with how we're planning our next steps as a group. We're going to be sending it, or we have a survey that we're going to be sending out to everybody too, because we want to know what you want to do moving forward. I personally don't think meeting once every two years is sufficient. So <laughs> um, we're going to start putting some other things into play based on what everybody decides that they want and can, you know, has capacity for. So with that, Rosemary, should we transition? Yep, okay, I'm opening up the rooms. Okay, and, so if you get to a room and you're in a room with everybody you know, feel free to leave it and we can put you in somewhere else. We really wanna make sure that you're cross collaborating with new partners that you haven't met before. Okay, so people, we've started to move, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so maybe each of us check in. How many breakout rooms do we have? I'm gonna pause the recording. Welcome back, everybody. It was so fantastic to go into your breakout rooms and to have a chance to see what everybody was working on. We had some great discussions. We had a lot of groups that were really doing some partnering and connecting. People were already exchanging their contact information or connecting the dots and saying, hey, you're here and you need to talk to so-and-so. Here's their email address, email him today. And that's exactly what we're hoping to see. We also had a chance to look at the Padlet so far and had a chance to see what people were sharing and creating together and co-constructing. So we've got a little, about 15 minutes until Marquita's coming on. And so we wanna to come together to debrief for a few minutes and to just share about what your group talked about. And so just in maybe like a one minute format, if we could have somebody from group one share with us. And um, Rosemary, do you wanna put the Padlet up as people are sharing as well? So people can see what was constructed. So um, could we have a representative from group one share for a moment? Okay, anybody from breakout room one who'd like to share? I'm not sure what is this, which breakout rooms we were in. Yeah, I don't know the name, of, the number of the breakout. You know what, let's not even worry about it. Let's go ahead and have a group share. So either Carol or Marlena, do you want to, you want to, either one of you want to start off? I can start. Okay. Um, so I, so was, I just have to say you are such a champion because you have like, you have like jumped in the pool a hundred percent. I can't wait to like get to know you better and do whatever I can to help you. Cause it's been so impressive that you are coming in as like a, as like a, you know, fireball. I love it. Oh, I, love, I love it. And I, I, didn't I would like to say that Melina was in group one. <laughs> oh, was I supposed to be in group one? Oh, no, no, I'm just saying you were you were in group one. Perfect. Oh, that group was one. my original number. That, Got it. That Got was it. your Got room. It. Got <laughs> it. And I wanted to share something because um, the the speaker, what was her name? Tony. How do you say it? Tony. Tanet. Tanet. You could call Tanet. her Tony. Also, okay, Tanet. She was saying like, "What are you bringing to?" I, I probably shouldn't be sharing, but I anyway. I. I have this in my office and it says the joys of disequilibrium because Renee the other day was saying we're all in this disequilibrium stage and I was like okay take that and like go go with that so anyway if there are some joys to disequilibrium okay so I was with Jacqueline Lopez Anna Garcia Nevarez Denise Kennedy and myself and we said we said we are steeped in early childhood and child development 
We are instructors, professional development providers. We build competencies and workforce capacities. We are teacher preparers. We celebrate learners' lives, diversity, learning styles, equity, learning journeys, developing, and tr transformation. We battle constant inequities, constant misunderstandings, lack of professionalism in the perception of our field, um, poor working wages, inequitable pay, many obstacles for the workforce, counselors not understanding that ECE is birth to age eight and that e the ECE degree is valuable to someone entering elementary or other learning settings. Um, we need funding and understanding of our field, support from the community, support from uh, CTC, CDE, and other leadership roles. We need people with ECE slash CD backgrounds in statewide leadership, better pathways into the K through 12 system, especially when entering ad administrative roles, because our workforce doesn't always have a teaching credential or an admin credential, but they're, um, they're well prepared and anyway. Um, and we need to make sure that the current workforce is considered for or brought into universal preschool, TK, early TK, um, TPE, to those new roles opening up. Instead of folks with teaching credentials going down, we, want, we need the current workforce considered for that. Elevation, we need elevation in all of our areas. Keep, keep that word, everybody, elevate. Sorry to interrupt there. No, no, and then we're done, that's it. That's ours. That was perfect. Um, this is fascinating to watch and to see what people have here. And we're gonna take all of this and help build what's happening next with us. Okay, just so everybody knows. That was wonderful, thank you so much. Carol, do you wanna go next? Okay, I won't put anybody on the spot. Who would like to share next? I also saw in the chat about Kathleen and her breakout session was Sorry. having a discussion about men in education, so we can revisit that too. And I think Carol's coming on right now to share. Yeah, I was I was on mute, didn't know. I think ours is right here. We are community colleges, four-year colleges, bottom right. Uh, private colleges, teachers, yeah, right up there. Okay, I have, we need consistent long-term funding for community college and high school pathways uh, to encourage those students to see that as a viable uh, career path. And of course, with that, it, in fact, I don't know, can you open that further? I don't know where the rest of it is. Um, maybe I could just remember, um, let me see, it's kind of, we talked about we balance constant challenges for our students, not just in money and, and funding for their uh, livelihoods, but also uh, transportation, getting to college, getting babysitting, maybe, you know, making it open for them to attend higher education. But we battle, we need higher wages for them, again, to see this as a permanent career path. It goes back to those wages over and over and over. Um, I, I'm having to do this from memory because I'm not sure which one it is, which one is ours. Kathleen was our recorder. Do you see which? Oh, we celebrate students for their commitment. Uh, we really do, and, and we just see that in them and their desire to, to love and work with young children. We celebrate that. We need a system that is singular. Right now, we feel that we are working with demands from QI, QRIS, with the TPEs, TPAs, uh, all kinds of requirements coming in, when do we have time to teach? Uh, so it's like we'd like it under one system and not have so many uh, coming at us at once. Um, Kathleen, jump yeah. in anytime you want. 
Sure, I, I can see what, um, um, uh, I, I summed up some of the conversations with too many hoops to jump through. And then I added my commentary, which is what other profession pays so poorly and demands so much. Um, and that we're not really, uh, you know, when we talk about the money coming out from the state right now, state budget, um, we still have a bifurcated system where we're not really looking at early childhood teachers as being um, future K-12 teachers. We haven't really groomed that pathway. And um, that a lot of that happens, a lot of that grooming happens at the community college level. And we're really not funded right now at all to do this work, not one penny. So if we're gonna start recruiting um, a diverse workforce that has a job in early childhood, has a job in after school, stays in school, goes into K-12, goes into TK. If we, uh, we wanna groom that pathway, um, we need funding to do that work. And we also need to make sure our ECE and after school workforce are paid more because we did talk about wages and the pay is so poor that in and out Burger, uh, someone was in Southern California, I think in and out Burger is their big competition. And up here it's Starbucks and Target. So we do all this child development training and they leave us to go to in and out and Starbucks. Well, and even McDonald's, because right now McDonald's, you can start at like $16 an hour, plus they have tuition programs. Right. So even our fast food are putting in tuition programs to get people to work for them. And yet we don't have that opportunity. Right. You know, I was told that an in and out manager makes six figures. Yes, <laughs> I know that for yeah. sure, Carol, because one of my friend's husband is in leadership in yeah. in and out and they have a humongous, beautiful ranch and a very comfortable lifestyle. And he yeah. works his tail off. No, get, don't get me wrong. He works hard. Right. Yeah. yeah. And Bill's saying, do we want categorical funding or um, I think we need ongoing permanent funding, but um, sure. Uh, any, at this point, the beginning of the pipe, I think the point is the beginning of the pipeline has no, no money. The money tends to go to, once you're in a credential program, you get this mm -hmm. and this, or once you are in a residency program, you get this and this, and we're going to expand this end, but we don't have people going into that end. Um, we need the front end. Um, I'll add that front end. So yeah, we have a lot of comments in here, but thank you group. This is great, good job. Let's go ahead now to another group. We've got Marquita coming on in about seven minutes. So let's spend about five more minutes debriefing this. If we could have another group share, that would be fantastic. Um, Renee, I guess our group will go Leah and Kathleen uh, two, number two. Um, <laughs> so we had a Kathleen too. So Leah, do you want to start? Because she was our note taker and she did a dynamic job on the Padlet. Also, I, I love that you just said about financial aid in there. Just, I love that. <clears throat> I love that. As somebody- Go ahead, go ahead I can't even find years. where we wrote our stuff. Oh, you can't find it? All right, I'll, get, I'll try my best to just give a quick, let me see here. Really okay, quick, go ahead. Cap. Um, okay, we celebrate learners. No, that's not us. That was a good one. Um, oh, here we are. We are uh, facilitators of learning, advocates and collaborators and partners with our students. We celebrate every student's individuality, nurturing our students and providing a sense of belonging and community. And we battle our own individual implicit bias and unconscious bias and individualized and global microaggression. And then we did get into a really rich conversation you know, about um, the different types of things specifically that adjuncts face at community colleges, not being offered tenure. Those of us that are outspoken, um, typically are deemed as difficult, even though we are speaking on behalf of our students and trying to elevate their voice and make sure that they are co-creators of their education. And we're sometimes given the least desirable classes or not given classes at all. And so we talked about that as well. Um, but we had a really rich dialogue. And then I would like to, um, you know, welcome my teammates to the virtual stage to also share if I've, I've missed anything. So Kathleen or Leah. Were you talking to me, Lisa? 
Yes, I was inviting you. I was inviting you. Oh, sorry. I couldn't hear what you said. It was kind of echoey and I didn't understand it. We also talked about when we got into some of our um, blocks, like what are the barriers? We found that there are institutional barriers that what, where we don't feel supported to do what we need to do. And the example, and I've talked about this be, before at previous meetings about the um, course outline for education one. It's a K through 12 course supposedly, but they're only, they can only do their observations in K through five, which leaves out our whole group of students who are interested in secondary ed. And I have been battling this since 2016 to no avail. And it's incredibly frustrating and it's a huge barrier to the students who want to go into secondary ed. And we, I in particular, cannot seem to find a way to move past that barrier. Um, and there are other issues where the, the institutions of education in which we work are institutions of business. Those, those businesses don't always go hand in hand with what we do in the classroom. And so there's this often this clash and there's got to be a way where we can come together and work in an integrated way to achieve what we need to achieve for all of the students. And when we were also talking about inequity at the very end, I was mentioning there's also in terms of salary, and I know we've mentioned this with early childhood, but also men, I, I interview all of the male students that I have and I say, you know, what, how do you feel about coming into this field and why do you think there aren't more men here? And inevitably the conversation comes down to, I can't support my family on this salary. And there's, and even my female students say their families are trying to convince them not to go into teaching because they won't make any money. And so they settle with, well, but I don't do it for the money. And how ironic is that? Because we, we do a lot to get to where we are and we do a lot once we're in the field and why shouldn't we be paid more so that it is more equitable so it is more commensurate with other businesses you know so it's again we're back to that how do we attract attract and retain the best and the brightest and that's a conversation that's been going on since the 90s i mean we keep having the same conversations we've got to find a resolution and move and do something Kathleen, I'm so with you on this one. My husband's in private industry and he makes more than twice than what I do. And I'm the one who has two master's degrees. <laughs> right? And I'm sorry, but we need to stop making it that teachers should be martyrs and that you were, exactly. it's okay. You know, it's okay to not be able to pay your bills because you're doing, you know, good work. I'm sorry, yeah. it is inexcusable. I agree. And it's time to make changes. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. And I just do want to add too, Renee. Um, that it's also the institutions. It's also the people that are the gatekeepers, the ones that do the hiring, the ones that uh, practice nepotism on a daily basis, the ones that have been in position of power and control for years and just choose not to step aside to allow someone else to lead, and the ones that get offended by true collaborative effort and holding people accountable and what it means to be co-constructors of this, this work. And that sometimes you're gonna be uncomfortable because when you're speaking truth and you're a truth teller, not everybody's going to feel comfortable. And guess what? I like that. I like to be challenged. But I, I think I think that that's also an issue. I think that's a big issue. There's a lot of gatekeepers. They want to keep their little, you know, nice cushion position and they don't want to let other people in. And to your point earlier about when you question something or make a request, you're, you're titled, you're deemed to be difficult to work with because you're setting clear boundaries and saying, this is what I need. As if your needs don't matter in this whole collaboration. Well, and I've got to be honest, I know we have one more group who's going to debrief next, but I really, I've been pushing for a while this idea of we need to do a statewide marketing campaign, grassroots, billboards along Highway 5. I, I drive Highway 5 and I hear about water and the water and Newsom and the water and Newsom and the farmers. And I'm like, why isn't there something here that says, be a teacher? It's your plan A. We're gonna teach you how to make money, how to get through as fast as possible and have an enriching career that you will, you will be an agent of change and you will impact people for the rest of your life. Yes. Like this is the time to elevate it. And so I love that we're having these conversations. Sorry, you know, I get really- I know, I just, <laughs> I'm passionate, I'm passionate. So let's go back to our last group who's gonna share and then we're gonna to transition to Marquita and continue the conversation. This has been so rich, everybody, thank you. What other groups would like to share?
I am always the master of the uncomfortable silence for a minute. I will give it one more minute of uncomfortable silence if anybody wants to share. And then if nobody else does, we can transition. Okay, maybe that wasn't a minute, but it seems like we're ready to transition. And so this is wonderful, this conversation. We are going to be taking everything, like I shared earlier, we literally printed and we're highlighting, Rosemary and I met for hours yesterday, trying to make sure that we're capturing what's happening um, within all of these cross system activities. Because, you know, if we end up getting this proposal that we've put through, where we are, you know, praying that we're going to have these teacher preparation hubs across the state of California, this conference will have constructed what we want that to be and what we need it to be. And so thank you so much for your participation. Thank you for your partnership and just for being involved in the conference and for giving your time and being involved in the conference. We know it's a busy time of the semester and um, we so appreciate everybody. Um, and I agree with Claire, we need to connect more and continue the conversations. We will be distributing a survey to everybody in the conference. And one of the things that we are asking within that survey is how often do we need to meet? And I gotta be honest, it's been two years since we've brought everybody together. I envision this as an annual conference. I envision quarterly meetings or regional, we need to break this, it can't be every two years. So thank you so much for doing this important work. With that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. And I'm so excited she's here. She, Marquita is one of the best um, partners in education. If you have an opportunity to work with her, um, you're a lucky person because she's a true collaborator and somebody that you can connect with. Um, let me go ahead and read her official bio. Dr. Marquita Grinot Schreier. Oh, and I apologize. Marquita, I, one of my very best friends, her net last name is Schreier, and I always add this extra R in your name, in your last name. I apologize. It's in love for my friend Blanca. So I apologize <laughs> that it happens, but it's just because my girlfriend Blanca has almost your exact same last name. So Dr. Marquita Bruno Sh 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 see my, it's like my automatic. Shire. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Did you see my mouth is like forming into the R? Like I, I can't control it. So I apologize, Marquita. But Marquita serves as the assistant vice chancellor, <laughs> education preparation or educator preparation and public schools program for the CSU office of the chancellor. Marquita is responsible for leading, coordinating and facilitating system-wide efforts to recruit, prepare and retain teachers counselors and school leaders for schools and communities. She represents the CSU at state and federal levels, providing policy and practice recommendations to ensure high quality educator preparation programs. Prior to this appointment, she served as the Dean of the College of Education at Cal State University Long Beach. Um, Marquita serves on the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing, the West Ed Board, and was recently appointed to the Board of Directors for the American Association for Col of Colleges for Teacher Education. She was a member of the American Association of State Colleges and Universities Teacher Education Task Force and Teacher Preparation, which produced the report, Preparing Teachers in Today's Challenging Context. She previously served two terms as a board member for the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation and served as a commissioner on the Commission of Standards and Performance Reporting for the CAEP from 2012 to 2013. She earned her PhD in special education from the Joint Doctoral Program at U, um, University of California, Los Angeles and University, or sorry, California State University, LA. In recognition of her career accomplishments, she was selected as the Distingu Distinguished Alumnus CSULA Charter College of Education in 2008. Thank you so much, Marquita, for being here today. And everyone, let's welcome Marquita. Thank you so much, Renee. That, um, that's a very, very kind introduction. So thank you for the opportunity to spotlight the CSU. As a proud alum of Cal State LA, I'm pleased to share the good work of the CSU, which I've been part of for over three decades. It's hard to believe. So as I understand it, I have the opportunity to spotlight the CSU. So what I wanted to do was to begin with a little bit of context and then address how CSU is preparing the educator workforce. <clears throat> um, and I know I have 25 minutes, is that correct, Renee? Yes. Do I, want, do I want to leave time for questions? If you're up for it, Marquita, that would yep. be we transition at 12.30 to our final breakout for the conference. Okay, I will go quickly because I do want to um, 
make sure that if there's any questions. I'm getting notices to admit people. Should I go ahead and admit? Oh, them? don't worry about it. Just because we made you co-host, so you can share screen. Okay, so I'll ignore that. Take okay, care of all that. Thank you. All right, great. So let me again. I'm gonna try and frame the context and then talk a little bit about what CSU is specifically doing to prepare the educator workforce. So let me just begin in terms of where we are. As is true every year, August is the time for new shoes, backpacks, lunch bags, and students eager to return to school to see their friends. This year, however, again, this anticipation is once again braided with anxiety as fires engulf some of our communities and the COVID-19 Delta variant threatens. I know we're all weary of the pandemic, but I also know our educators are resilient and continue to lean into the work and support of student success. Um, educator preparation, the CSU is framed around our system-wide initiative of Graduation Initiative 2025 whose goal is to ensure students come to us academically prepared for the rigor of college work. And that's the work that we do in educator preparation to support teachers, counselors, and leaders. The initiative um, also wants to make sure that our students, once they're admitted, engage in a high quality major of their choice. They graduate in a timely manner um, we have a specific uh, goal to reduce four and six year graduation rates, and then to close those persistent equity gaps. Um, our new chancellor, Joseph Castro, building upon the work of our previous chancellor, has stated his commitment and, and direction to the leadership team to continue to focus on closing those gaps. Our faculty in the CSU understand the intersection of research and practice and curricula and field experiences are designed to develop well-prepared and culturally responsive future educators. I and my leadership team support initiatives and our campus partners to recruit, prepare, and retain diverse teachers, counselors, leaders, focus on equity and excellence. I would encourage you to spend a little time visiting our department website to learn more about our programs. I'm gonna briefly highlight several of them. I, I know they will be familiar to you. The Center for the Advancement of Reading and Writing uh, supports our campuses and other stakeholders to ensure the preparation of highly skilled teachers and literacy specialists for California students. The center supports the work of ERWC, the Expository Reading and Writing Curriculum, which has fundamentally changed how English teachers prepare high school students for college. And ERWC, as you know, is used in thousands of school districts in California and across the nation. Secondly, CAP, the California Academic Partnership Program, is an intersegmental program working with all segments of higher education and the K-12 system. And this work is focused on equity, and excellence for students, both students and educational professionals. Next, we have Cal State Teach, which is our online elementary um, preparation program. It is an Apple award-winning program and it um, provides um, the credential program, um, again, all online for to about 9,000 uh, students thus far. Our Educator Quality Center, uh, since 2001, EdQ, enables CSU administrators and, and campus faculty to monitor the effectiveness of and make needed improvements in our preparation of PK, PK-12 students, uh, teachers for California public schools. The center coordinates evaluation, which provides information on employ employment outcomes for our recent graduates and their supervisors. And we take this data and we share it across campuses to understand best practices. And then finally, we have the most recently newly established Center for the Advancement of Instruction and Quantitative Reasoning. And this center is focused on ensuring that students come to us academically prepared specifically in the area of quantitative reasoning. So when I think about this past year, there are a couple of silver linings that I think have emerged. And these include dedicated and caring educators who demonstrated their ability to pivot to virtual instruction almost overnight. These educators have collaborated in new ways resulting in innovative ideas and strategies to support both student learning and student mental health. These educators have worked alongside family members and mental health professionals to continue to support their students' academic and social emotional growth. 
And, in sp and, and finally, there's been an increased awareness and appreciation for teachers, which is a long time coming. In spite of declining interest in teaching over the last several years, this past year in the CSU, we saw a 15% increase in admissions to our credential programs. And when I think about this and in talking to the deans, we attribute this to two primary reasons. First, the suspension of several admission requirements in response to the pandemic. And as you know, AB 130 will develop, per will develop permanent alternative ways to demonstrate basic skills requirement and subject matter competence. The second um, reason we think we've seen this increase, and, and I'm, I'm encouraged by this, is there seems to be a renewed sense of commitment to social justice and equity as, as evidenced by the candidates. That is, some of our deans are reporting that new applicants are indicated that they want to become teachers right now to make a difference in their communities. I'm hopeful that the next generation of teachers will reflect the passion, commitment, and thoughtfulness demonstrated by former student liaison to the Commission on Teacher Credentialing, Ms. Corey Jones. If you have a few minutes, go listen to the August Commission meeting and you will be inspired by this young woman. A final silver lining that I think about that COVID has uh, sh shown me is um, that COVID pandemic has shown a harsh light on the systemic disparities in schools that has resulted in a renewed commitment to continue our collective work to dismantle barriers to ensure that we are recruiting, preparing, and retaining educators who reflect the students they serve. So to address both the teacher shortage and to the lack of diversity in the teaching force, we have to work at all points of the pipeline, as I mentioned the other day. And I wanna again highlight this recent publication from the Partnership for the Future of Learning. It describes several key elements. Um, and I'm gonna briefly go through them again. Effective recruitment that is targeted at different populations, beginning in high school, all the way through career changers. We have to have a, a keen focus on service scholarships and forgivable loans. We have to make sure that our preparation um, results is culturally responsive to ensure our graduates are prepared to address these systemic inequities in schools. We have to continue to advocate for and, and speak truth to power in terms of developing supportive working conditions for our teachers, including high quality induction and mentoring. We know that working conditions and supportive leaders are key to retaining this diverse teacher workforce. And then once again, we have got to continue to support and fight for competitive and equitable uh, compensation. On Wednesday, the panel was asked to describe how our work impacts the other education systems and best practices for bringing education systems together to create seamless pathways. And as I indicated um, previously, 50 to 60% of our students transfer from community college partners such, such as all of you. And so our work has always involved community colleges and school districts. Um, I wanna again, shout out the Regional Communities of Practice Framework that was developed several years ago by colleagues from the California State University, the, uh, Ca the California Community College Chancellor's Office. And I wanna shout out uh, Colleen McKinley and Sue Parsons from Cerritos um, Community College Teacher Track. And so in this framework, we set a list of initiatives and suggestions that we think key leaders need to um, continue to implement. And when I heard Renee say that the proposal that you all are working on and your goal to continue these convenings, I would strongly encourage you to use that framework as a way to come together to think about how to support teachers across segments. Um, so as we said on Wednesday, Wednesday, not only do we need to improve our collective efforts, we need to hold ourselves accountable for the educators we produce. That is, we need to continue to assess and monitor who gets accepted into our credential programs, who completes our programs in a timely manner, and then to understand where do our graduates end up and how do we continue to support them in their school districts. As you know, legislation passed in 2019 
called for the establishment of a statewide longi longitudinal data system for California. Many other states have these longitudinal data, longitudinal data systems. The proposed cradle to career data system aims to link existing education, workforce, financial aid, and social service information to better equip policymakers, educators, and the public to address disparities and opportunities and to improve outcomes for all, stu all students. This initiative, uh, if passed, will support our continuous improvement efforts as we learn from our graduates which elements of their programs were most helpful and most effective and what needs to be improved. So let me end these brief remarks by describing two recent initiatives um, that in the CSU that are focused on recruitment, preparation, and support of diverse candidates. I briefly mentioned them um, on Wednesday, but I'd like to take a little deeper dive on both of them. The first is the Chancellor's Office Learning Lab to close the diversity gap. The Educator Quality Center, which I mentioned earlier, is working or has worked with five campus teams to address the demographic mismatch between the teachers we prepare and the students and communities that we serve. About two years ago, the CSU deans examined data for CSU credential teachers that showed that the diversity of teachers being produced by the CSU does not match the districts in which these teachers are gaining employment. Let me emphasize this is not unique to the California or the CSU, but is part of a national pattern that has a long history. Our education deans made a collective commitment to examine this discrepancy more closely and to do something about it. So the Educator Quality Center is serving as a hub for the improvement network that utilizes improvement science methods to examine the problem and test changes that could be spread and scaled across the CSU system if, if successful. These efforts will expand with our new center, which is the Center for Transformational Educator Preparation Programs, or CTEP. Um, this past summer, the CSU received a $3 million grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to establish CTEP. The center will leverage the successes of a previous uh, initiative. Um, a previous initiative, the New Generation of Educators Initiative, or NGI, which was supported by the SD Bechtel Jr. Foundation. And this, this initiative, this center, our aim is to recruit, prepare, retain Black, Indigenous, and teachers of color to serve California's diverse student population. CTEP will support um, our campuses and district teams with three key initiatives as we work towards the aims aligned with the vision and mission of the center. The first is the Transformation Lab, or T-Lab, in which campus teams will engage in assessment of the preparation programs, choose specific aims, and then work towards them with the guidance of improvement coaches from the EdQ Center. The second is the Equity and Excellence Certificate. certificate. Team members will be funded through the grant to participate in two units of professional development to earn a newly developed CSU Excellence and Equity Certification. I'll mention here that our goal is to offer this certification to a broad audience, um, including not only our campus teams and our district partners, but community members and community college partners. So um, as soon as this is up and running, I will share more information. And then the third initiative is a transformative teaching and learning community in which team members will network through virtual meetings, share content, and be provided with curated resources, again, all focused on the recruitment, retention, and support of teachers of color. We begin our work officially this fall with four CSU campuses, so stay tuned for this work. So let me just close by, again, saying what I said on Wednesday, as we begin this crazy fall term, I encourage us to lean into this work and continue to lean on one another across our segments. There are both unprecedented challenges and opportunities that have emerged over the last 18 months that I think will change how we educate future educators and how we recommit and reimagine our education systems for the long term. As I said on Wednesday, this is the time to think and act boldly on behalf of all our students. And I look forward to doing this work together with all of you. 
So Renee, I'm happy to um, address any questions or hear any comments that folks might have. That would be great, Marquita. I was writing down what you said there because I love that think boldly. I think that's exactly what we need to do. And I absolutely agree mm -hmm. with you that we are, we are reimagining education right now. There's a lot of silver linings from what have ha what's happened this last 18 months. So that was beautiful. What questions do we have for Marquita? What a nice, that was fantastic. And thank you for the opportunity to ask you questions. Of course, of course. Okay, who would like to speak and has a question? Or comments. I'm also happy to hear comments from participants. I see Steve. Hi, Steve. Hey, Marquita, how are you? Thank you. For I'm this. well, how are you? Yeah, doing really well, thank you. Um, it's exciting what's happening at the CSU and all the funding that you're getting um, to really try to wrap these efforts up. And I'm, I'm wondering in the future if there would be a way to, um, because of really the lack of funding for the community colleges, is a way to maybe, maybe create that bridge, you know, um, in terms mm -hmm. of an actual supporting opportunity when one of these foundations come up with these, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, ideas to really put some of this into practice with maybe a joint proposal, something that mm -hmm. would work. I mean, it doesn't have to be a huge scale, but something on a smaller scale that at least to pilot some things that we really want to try to get done um, in our state um, and to try to break down some of these systems that exist and kind of stifle our students. So yes, I, I those of you who know me and as Renee in her kind introductions, I, I our work has always been collaborative. I want to clarify something though. The recent governor's budget, as generous as it was, and as grateful as I am to the governor and the legislature, there was not specific funding for teacher preparation in the governor's budget. We were all hopeful there might be. And so each of the, each of the systems, of course, received funding, but a lot of funding went to our K-12 partners. And so what I would encourage us to think about and, and we're doing in the CSU is how, given the existing funding and the residency grants in particular, how do we work with our district partners to develop um, either new residency programs or support existing resident, residency programs news, using those Prop 98 funds. And so, um, I would encourage CSUs, community colleges, and their regional district partners to come together right now, because those funds are being available, are available right now through the commission to develop new grants, um, to develop new residency programs that possibly can begin in community colleges and, and, and possibly can develop the, those seamless pathways that we have talked about for so many years. But, but Steve, you know, I'm very interested in ensuring that we do have those, those well-aligned um, uh, um, curricular designs and, and advising for community college students so they know exactly how to get to a CSU. And not just one CSU, as you and I have talked about, we need to have them figure out how to get to multiple CSUs within one region. Thank you. Of course. I see Nancy has her hand up. Uh, hi, Marquita and uh, hey, Nancy. Hi, Renee. Uh, one of the things I was wondering about is how does this new uh, T Lab work with the Uplift grant that California got? Because I know that is one that, like Cal Poly, got it, and we are working with Norco College. So it is a combination mm -hmm. of CSU's community colleges and the field, because we're also working with Baldwin Unified. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if the T-Lab will in some way expand what is happening with this uplift grant that is a combination, or how is it working with it? So the T-Lab is really going to be focusing on those improvement science activities on campuses as we explore where in the pipeline are we losing candidates. So where I think there would be interaction with the Uplift project, Nancy, is more in um, the, um, the, the learning community, the third component, where we are developing a set of curated resources, working with district and community college partners to share this information. That's where I think there can be some interaction um, between Uplift California and the new CTEP grant. I will, I will say to you that there are 
um, some partners who are involved in both of those grants. And so we, of course, all talk with one another. Um, and with this focus on uh, developing a uh, strong early learning workforce, I think we have some great potential in the next couple of years using, using the center as well as this grant and hopefully other grants that we get in the near future. Wonderful. Do we have a final question for Marquita? I see Denise just raised her hand. Yes, sorry. I'll be quick. Um, thank you so much, Marquita, for all that you do. Yes, um, we course. appreciate that very much. Um, I just wanted, I was curious, which four CSUs are part of that CTEP grant? Uh, I should know this by heart. Um, <laughs> and, you and, have and a lot I'm, of things on your plate. I'm <laughs> no, I'm going to pull up my notes because I do not want to miss, uh, uh, miss quote. So it, just give me one second. Oh my gosh, I really should know this by heart, but you know what? There is a lot on my plate these days. Um, yeah, I recently saw something where I went, oh my gosh, there's 116 community colleges now. So I- Okay, here we go. <laughs> You're not alone. Bakers Bakersfield, Cal Poly Slow, Humboldt and Northridge. I should have mentioned that our goal with the center is to involve all CSU campuses over the life of the three-year grant. And we're very hopeful that if we meet the goals of our grant, that there, there's the possibility of additional funding, whether it's through the Gates Foundation or other foundations. Um, I wanna emphasize that this Gate grant built upon the success of a previous grant that was funded by the SD Bechtel Jr. Foundation. And so our, our faculty and our administrators, our staff um, work really hard to demonstrate the good work that we do and it is recognized by our foundation partners and and i'm i'm so pleased for our faculty and students that they are recognized thank you so much marquita for being here and for being a partner and my pleasure like you um you walk the talk and that is so deeply deeply appreciated um, it's just wonderful. So thank you so much, Marquita. We deeply appreciate you. I wanted to let everybody know we are now moving to our final breakout section or session of the conference, um, which is really, really exciting. And um, I can't believe we're already there. We've got three really different presentations coming up. One from the Commission on Teacher Credentialing that's focusing on competency-based ECE preparation and licensure. The second session that we have going on is beyond the, the CID, expanding under, undergraduate pathways and teacher prep. And then the last session that we have right now, Breakout, is about our communities of practice that have developed over the last um, 18 months during the pandemic in the community college system. And how do you create community together in a virtual space. So with that, let's transition to our last set of breakouts. Please join me for our call to action from 1.30 to 2, where we will all be back in the larger space. So everybody have a great breakout section. And um, I look forward to seeing you when we come back later on this afternoon. So Can have you? a good one, everyone. Yes. Um, I looked on my email and I don't see a registration link for the third one, the, the um, shifting practicum and field work. I'll put it in right now, OK? okay. Yep, thank you. Okay, that one is for the communities of practice. That's what I want, thank you. Okay, perfect, perfect. If anybody needs anything else, you just let me know. Okay, wonderful. Have a good session, everyone.